Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay, so just procedural matters. Um, so we've got some written homeworks due. Those written homeworks, remember, are from a week ago. They were what we did last, they were over what we did last Tuesday. Okay, and that, that happened to be lecture number three. And eventually there's going to be a quiz number three, and it's going to be over more or less that exact same material. Uh, yesterday morning, Monday morning, quizzes one and two opened uh, for, for you to do them. Uh, the window of time, remember, you've got to take them at the testing center, and the window is from yesterday morning until the close of business of the testing center uh, on Saturday, which I understand is not even open on Saturday, so that, I guess, technically means Friday. So if you haven't made an appointment yet, you need to make the appointment tonight. I don't, I don't mean to make the appointment for tonight. By no means do you need to, t do you need to take the quiz tonight. What I'm saying is that you need to make the appointment tonight so that tonight you know that you have a plan on Friday, I'm going to take the quiz at thus and such time. Or on Thursday, I'm going to take it at thus and such time. Yes? If it is open, okay, that's even better. So, because I, I was sure it was open on Saturday. And then, oh, it closes early. Okay, so stu stu students kept telling me it's not open, it's not open. And I thought, that's weird, because they're always open. Okay, good. I took quiz zero on Saturday. Okay, so then it is open, at least some of the time on Saturday. At any rate, that's why you need to make, a, you need to make an appointment, so that you know exactly when it's open, and that you have a time, because what you want to avoid, okay, is you want to avoid, like on Saturday at 5 p.m., saying, okay, it's time for me to schedule my quiz, only for you to realize that they close Saturday at noon. Okay, please don't do that. Okay. Any question about any of that? So now we're entering the period of the course where everything's going on simultaneously, which is to say, this week we're quizzing over week one. It's presently week three. You're being quizzed over week one. And you're, this week you're turning in homework over week two. And we're lecturing new material of week three. So all of the things are happening simultaneously. Okay, remember, homework is offset by one week from the lecture. Quiz is offset by two weeks from the lecture. And because all of that can get kind of confusing, especially when we get to like quiz eight, you know, and it'll be something like quiz eight roughly cor corresponds to lecture eight, which roughly corresponds to written homeworks 43 through whatever, right? Who can remember all those numbers? Okay, for that reason, uh, I'll po I have posted and I'll point out to you tonight a table that says this lecture corresponded to these homeworks and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so any question about any of the procedural matters before we get to calculus? Okay, so last time we were talking about uh, the fundamental theorem, and we're still going to talk about that a little bit. And just to remind you about the players in the game is that there's two seemingly quite different procedures going on. On the one hand, we have antiderivative. Now, derivative is what you did, the primary thing that you did in Calculus 1. And it's a machine where you, you put a function into it, and then it, it does its thing, and a function comes out. It has a function as an input and a function as an output. So for example, what is the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. If you were to put the x cubed function in to the derivative, then 3x squared would come out on the other side. Antiderivative is that thought is the thought experiment where you say, well, <laughs> what if I just ran that machine in reverse? What if I push that function back in on the other side, and then what would come out? 
Well, that's what we've been talking about. That is antiderivative. Okay, so we talked about that. We did some, a bunch of antiderivatives. We did a nice technique for antiderivatives, the u substitution, which is to say a variable differential substitution to undo the chain rule. Antiderivative. So this is derivative in reverse. Then after we talked about that and got good and comfortable with it, then we did a, a strange thing. We sidestepped for a minute and talked about this, uh, this other matter that seemingly is not related. It, it's, it really, every time I do it, it always seems non sequitur. But, I, but it's not because I know the punchline, right? So what I mean to say is we were talking about integral Now what integral is, that's where you take shapes that look like this. You've got three sides that are sort of well-behaved, right? The left, the left is a vertical line, the right is a vertical line, the bottom is a horizontal line, and then this shape is going to a party, so it puts on a fancy hat and looks like this. And its hat can be described by this function f of x, and we said, well, what it, this, this shape is not common enough in human experience to have a name, not like a, not like a rectangle or a circle or something really common, which is so common it, it demands a name. Now, this is just a shape. But it has an area in the sense that it could be painted. Right? You could paint it. And the way that we define its area is we said, OK, we're going to break this shape into rectangles. Now, for, for the purposes of engineering, say, you could make four slices, and you could come up with four rectangles. And you could overestimate the area, say, if you wanted to paint it. Because after all, if it's an engineering problem, when you purchase paint, you usually purchase it like in, say, five-gallon buckets or something like that. It really, you really don't need to know the amount of paint that's necessary to paint this down to the thimble full, right? Down to the drop. It's not necessary for engineering. You just need to know to the nearest five gallons and then go one over so you don't, <laughs> so you don't run out. But this is a calculus class, so we want to know exactly exactly what the area is. So we say, okay, we're not going to cut it into eight. We're not going to cut it into 80 or even 80 million rectangles. We're going to cut it into infinitely many rectangles. Okay, we're going to cut it into infinitely many rectangles and we're going to add up the area of all of those rectangles and that's the area. And that procedure of cutting a shape into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles and continuously summing them all up, that procedure is called an integral. So even though this shape is not common enough in human experience to have a name, we still have a formula for its area. The area for this shape is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. That's its formula. That's just like the, the area of a circle is pi r squared, and the area of a triangle is 1 half base height. The area of this shape is integral a to b of f of x dx. The surprising bit is that these two seemingly very disconnected procedures, running the derivative in reverse, cutting something into infinitely many infinitesimal pieces and adding up all their areas, they're intimately related to each other in the following way. And that is that if you blow up this thing to make it a little bigger to look at. <clears throat> and if this is A and this B, then 
what, what we did is we said, okay, we're going to cut this into pieces. Right? In the middle here, we're going to make these rectangles. We're going to do all that. We're going to work so hard in the middle here. Do so much work with all the, the stuff in the middle. And all of that work is symbolized by this. But what the fundamental theorem is saying, what the fundamental theorem is saying is that if little f is very nice in the following way, so like a very nice function, not a, not a weird and crazy function. So if in the first place it's integrable, So that's kind of a technical condition that's not really so relevant in this class. I just mean that you, you could actually, in principle, perform this procedure, and it would make sense. That you could cut it up into infinitely many rectangles. And furthermore, uh, big F is an antiderivative of little f. So if, if little f is integrable, and it has an antiderivative, and you know what it is, then instead of cutting this shape into infinitely many rectangles, instead of taking the time to do that, all that you have to actually do is take its antiderivative and evaluate it at the, the left endpoint and the right endpoint and then subtract. I'd like to point out to you just how incredible this is in case you forgot <laughs> when I went, went off the rails last time. What this is saying is that instead of cutting this shape up and being so concerned about what's happening in here, the height of all these rectangles, what the fundamental theorem is saying that if you have an antiderivative, you only have to measure it twice, once at the left point and once at the right point. That's it. You don't need to measure it in the middle at all. That's incredible. It's just incredible. And that's the way all science, all, not all, that's too strong. A great majority of science proceeds. For, for example, there is such a thing as electrical charge. Things can be negatively charged, positively charged, and neutral. Like electrons and protons and that kind of thing. So. If, the, if we had something that was electrically charged, say like this calculator was electrically charged and it had a relatively strong electrical charge and, and we knew that it was electrically charged and we knew that nothing else in this room was electrically charged, then do you think I could determine the electrical charge of this calculator without even coming in the room? And the answer is yes, I can. Because if you permit me to take an electrical meter, a field meter, and go all the way around the room and measure the electrical field strength all the way around the room, then I can tell you the electrical charge of that calculator. I don't even need access to it. And, and what I'm telling you is this is the exact same thing as this. Are you telling me that you can find the area of that shape by only measuring on the edges? And the answer is, yes, you can. That's exactly what the fundamental theorem is saying. It's an incredible thing. So I'm trying to be impressed with it, because I want you to be impressed with it. That this is not, this is not a minor thing. This is a big thing. OK, so any question before we get to some calculations? Is this okay? <clears throat> it, it just brings up so many possibilities, right? So, for example, it's, it's known that the center of the Earth is solid. 
it's also a fact that no one's ever been there, right? <laughs> How could we possibly figure that out? Well, where can we be? We can be on the surface of the earth, right? Making measurements on the surface of the earth, we can determine what the center is like without ever being there. And it's, it's the same kind of idea and technique. Okay. So, uh, for example, the integral from 2 to 5 of 6x squared minus 3x plus 5. Oh, yeah, I need to say one other thing. It's just a technical matter. So this process of doing the derivative in reverse is called antiderivative. And this process of cutting shapes up into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles and continuously summing their areas is called integral. However, your book uses slightly different names for these two things. Your book refers to this as an indefinite indefinite integral and refers to this one as a definite integral. However, this is high on the list of things that I would change if I was math dictator for a day. Because this is, in, in my opinion, a, a disgrace of terminology. Okay, because in the, one, on the, in the first place, it's not what these things were originally named. That's, their, their original names were related to antiderivative and integral. And in the second place, antiderivatives are a thing unto themselves. They're their own thing. And integrals are a thing unto themselves. And, and they're their own thing. They're not... Th th this, this goes too far, in my opinion, and it confuses the matter. You've got antiderivatives, you've got integrals. That being said, because this is the terminology that your books uses, I've, I won't, wouldn't do anything weird like count off, but I would encourage you to think of them using these names. Right? Because the beginning of wisdom is, is giving things their proper name. Okay. So, on the one hand, to address this exercise, we could draw a picture and start cutting it into rectangles. What a boring thing that would be. Rather than doing that, let's use the fundamental theorem. So the question of whether or not you can use the fundamental theorem is the same as asking. You look at the corresponding antiderivative and you ask, do I know how to compute that antiderivative? So do you know how to compute that antiderivative? Yeah, you could anti-differentiate that. So what is the antiderivative? Almost. 2x two, two two X cubed. And then minus 3 halves x squared. And then plus 5x. Now, I'm not going to write plus c. Why am I not going to write plus c? Why not plus c? And the answer is that the fundamental theorem says that you can use any antiderivative. <coughs> How many antiderivatives does a function have? Infinitely many, right? That's what the plus c means. So like I could take this expression, 2x cubed minus 3 halves x squared plus 5x, and then I could add a 9. That would be one of the antiderivatives. I could add a 99. That would be another one. And then the way you symbolize all of them is you write plus c, because that c just means that's some free constant. But the fundamental theorem says you're free to choose whatever antiderivative. It doesn't matter which one you choose. So I'm picking, what I mean by not writing the C, is I'm picking the one that's easiest for me to deal with, which is to say I'm picking C to be what? Zero. 
I'm saying that, well, yeah, I could have said C is 12. That would have been fine. <laughs> but I'm going to make, make it to where C is 0, so I don't even have to write it at all. So what I'm telling you is that this is not an omission. I haven't forgotten the C. I've, specific, I've specifically chosen the C to be 0. Okay, so then what is the meaning of this notation? Plug 5 in. Plug 5 in. So that'd be 2 multiplied by 5 cubed minus 3 halves multiplied by 5 squared plus 5 multiplied by 5. And then what? And subtract. Very good. So 2 times. 2 cubed minus, no, yeah, minus 3 halves times 2 squared plus 5 times 2. So from here, it's just a bunch of boring arithmetic. So that's 125 times 2 is 250. That would be 75 halves, so minus 37 and a half, and then plus 25 minus 16 minus 6 plus 10. So I'm just going through the arithmetic. This is the boring part. Uh, so 275, uh, let's, let's use the calculator. 275 minus 37. I should have known that. Uh, 237.5 minus uh, 20. So 217.5. Any question about this? Is it wrong? It probably is. What's wrong with it? Is it not? Okay. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> well, it's t 250 and then 270. Okay. So do we agree with 217 and a half? Okay. So any question about this one? So I don't mind if you use your calculator as long as it's an exact answer. Okay, but if there's, other, if there's things like radicals and other fractions that you can't figure out, like I, I can agree with 0.5, we all understand what that means. But I want the exact answer. Because remember sort of what this is about, is that if you wanted to paint a fence, then in practice, actually, you just estimate the area of the fence and you just buy a little more paint than what, what you really need. And, and that means like you're going to estimate it, the fence with a number of rectangles and the rectangles do not need to be infinitely fine. However, in a calculus course, we're not interested in, a, in an approximation of the answer, at least not in this section. We want to know the exact answer. So I'm always going to want the exact answer. Any question about this? Okay, so now we need, <coughs> pardon me, a, new, a few properties of the antiderivative. Uh, sorry, the integral, actually. So, in the first place. The integral from a to b of a constant multiplied by f of x dx. So this is where k is a constant. <coughs> what can we do with that constant? It can come out of the integral, which is to say it's k multiplied by the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So now, let's argue why this should be reasonable. So, suppose that, 
Suppose that you had a fence. <coughs> that looked like this. So something like that. And then suppose that we, we cut the fence into four pieces, just four so that I have something definite to draw. Then I could, you know, make rectangles for each one. So this, this would be an overestimate. So I made an overestimate for the amount of area that I would need so I would know how much paint I need. Okay. So now, suppose that on this fence, your, your crazy fence, or your, you know, if you, or maybe you have an eccentric neighbor who has a crazy fence. Suppose that it takes exactly 15 gallons to paint. And then now, suppose further, that you make a replica of this fence. And you do it, you do it piece of wood for piece of wood. Right? So these being like little fence. What are those things called? The vertical pieces of a fence, of a wood fence. They have a name, right? Posts. Are they posts? Not the thing that holds the fence up, but the fence itself. What is that called? I'm at a loss. Plank? Is it a plank? We'll call it plank. I make no <laughs> warranty as to that being right. So, so we take all the planks, and we're going to make a replica, plank for plank. And suppose that the original fence takes exactly 15 gallons. But suppose that I make the modification on the new fence to make all the planks twice as tall. So all of them are now twice as tall. How much paint will be required on the new fence? Twice as much, right? Because if it took 15 gallons originally, and then I make a copy of the fence with the modification that I make it every plank twice as tall, then there's twice as much area, and it takes twice as much paint. Suppose I make a, another replica of the fence, except now, I, I, and I make it plank for plank. But then, suppose that it was 15 gallons originally, and I make, I make each individual plank one-third as tall as the original then how much paint does it take now? A third as much, right? That's what this constant is. So the constant is 15 or? No, that the integral is 15. The constant is me saying, I'm going to make it as a third. I'm going to make each one a third as tall. That's why the constant can come in and out. And that's, that's the meaning of that constant coming in and out. OK, two. What else can integrals do? We can do this. So the integral from a to b of the sum f of x plus g of x dx. Well, if this were an antiderivative, if we ignore the limits for a moment, then what could we do with this? Yeah. We could say, well, this is the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. OK. So both of these rules work exactly like the antiderivative does. The antiderivative ha d works in this way. And it also works in this way. And I, I, I claim that even though we didn't prove the fundamental theorem to be true, it is true. And there, that shows you the connection between antiderivatives and, and integrals. So it's reasonable, reasonable to believe that these should be true. Now here's a, another property. But it, has, it doesn't have a counterpart among, among antiderivatives, rather it takes, it takes its shape from the way we define the integral procedure. So specifically, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. 
So now, suppose that we take our, our fence, crazy fence there, A to B, like so. And suppose that we're going to make a fence like this. Well, in this region, it's going to look like that. Okay, then, and that's going to be the red part. I'll paint some of the fence red. Because <laughs> there's not an HOA, right? <laughs> we'll do it red. <laughs> and then, uh, we're going to do this other part green. Okay, so you can kind of see halfway through the, you know, not halfway, but part of the way through the, through the fence, it sort of changes its mind. Like, okay, well, I'm going to be the red fence for some of the time. I'm going to be the green fence for the rest of the time. And let's say that this occurs at point C. Well, we can break this integral into parts which correspond to the red part and the green part. What's the, what is the red part? Well, that would be the integral from a to c of f of x dx. That part corresponds to the red part alone. Okay, so what this is saying, the, this is saying the area of it all from a to b, the area of it all is the area of the red part, and then how do I finish this sentence? Plus, yes, the area, uh, C to B, the area of the green part. Mm, that's interesting. So, this is the red part. This is the green part. That doesn't really have a correspondence to antiderivatives. Okay, here's another interesting uh, integral feature. How about Let's try and interpret in terms of fences and painting and things like this. What, what could this possibly mean? Yeah. Be like <laughs> so you can kind of see like the width of the green piece is B minus C. And the width of the red piece is C minus A. And the width of the whole thing is B minus A. You know, so like if we were, if we were integrating from, from 20 to 18, uh, sorry, from, from 20 to 28, then the width of the shape would be 8 from 20 to 28. So then what is the, in, what is the width of the shape when you integrate from A to A? Yeah. Zero. It would be like saying, it would be like me holding up my fence and saying, this is, this is my the fence that I take around with me. And it's, it has zero width. It's right here. <laughs> would someone please volunteer to go to Home Depot and get enough paint to paint it? And then anyone could say, I've gone and come back and I have enough paint. How much paint does it take to paint such a fence? None, right? So what is the integral from A to A of f of x dx? Zero. Okay. Good. Any question about that? Okay. So 3 and 4 are properties of the integral which, in a sense, they don't inherit from the antiderivative.
They're sort of novel things. And then five, one more, is another thing that's just from the integral. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna write something, but I'm gonna leave something off uh, and then ask a question about what, what happened and what I left off. Okay, what I've written is not correct yet. So what, what is the, the difference between the left and the right hand side? Sorry? Right. Do you observe that the left-hand side is saying integral from A to B? And this one is saying from B to A. So that's the distinction between these two. Now these are not the same. They're not the same. Rather, how do I fix it? Put a negative sign. So when you switch the order, the order of integration, say, from 10 to 20, and you make it 20 to 10, then that causes the answer to be negated. Now let's try and think about why this should be reasonable. We've already talked about that the areas of some rectangles can be negative. For example, we talked about mm -hmm. that when we were talking about the business analogy of running a retail store that, that, are, open, that, that are open 24 hours. Well, in the middle of the night, like a Walmart, say, Walmarts can be losing money in the middle of the night because it costs more for them to run their business in the middle of the night, what with all the refrigeration, air conditioning and handling, and all the people making sure that the store is in an acceptable shape for tomorrow. Okay, it can cost more money than they're making at the registers. But Walmarts don't go out of business they lose money during that time, but they don't go out of business. Why do they not go out of business? Right. When you consider an entire 24-hour period, they're positive. If you consider just the bad time, bad, right, when they're just making the store ready for the, for the money-making part of the day, then they're losing money. But they're not, in the long term, they're not losing money. So, so, it's reasonable to have negative areas in the same sense that it's reasonable to make a negative profit. Now, why should it be this way? Let's make, a, let's make an analogy to painting, but not quite painting. So, another thing that you can do to make something look nice is you can take gold leaf, which is to say you can take a piece of gold and you can hammer it super, super, super thin, so thin that you can see through it, because gold is, has... Neat, neat physical properties. And you can take this very, very thin gold leaf, you can actually press it onto things and mash it, and then it stays there and it makes the stuff super shiny. Like the, like the crab from Moana, if you've seen that, right? The shiny crab? Okay, no, no. <laughs> A few people saying, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Well, if you were painting a fence and you were, and you were gonna leave, you wouldn't take the paint back off and take it with you. Right? You just, well, I'll just leave that paint. But if, if, you, if you gold leaf defense, you might, you might, you might take the, the gold leaf back. Right? So if you gold leafed your, your fence and made it super shiny, this one says how much you would need to put on, and this one says, well, that's how much you need to take off, right? doing the process in reverse. Okay, so taking it, taking it back, painting and unpainting. Mm -hmm. So... Any question about these? So now, we're talking about the fundamental theorem. And the fundamental theorem is the connection between antiderivative and integral. Notably, the only time that you can use the fundamental theorem is when the thing that you're integrating, you know the antiderivative of it. So how about this one? Uh, so please evaluate the integral of 2x minus 6 inside of absolute value dx and then we're going to integrate this from 1 to 
7. Okay. <clears throat> now, it would be terrific if we could use the fundamental theorem. Can we use the fundamental theorem? answer is no. We can't. The question of whether or not you can use the fundamental theorem more or less comes down to can I anti-differentiate that? So can you anti-differentiate that? You cannot. Now, how many antiderivatives do you know? in this class. Three. You know three of them. Let's write them down to be definite. The three that you know. You know the antiderivative of x to n dx. Well, what's that? Mm -hmm. Very good. Plus a constant. And of course, this only works when what? when n is not negative 1. So when n, is, when n is negative 1, then this is not permissible. Now, in the specific case that n is negative 1, that is to say you're, you're anti-differentiating x to negative 1, you usually write it in this way. Instead of writing x to negative 1, you write 1 over x. And as it turns out, we also know this antiderivative. Well, what is this one? Log, right, of absolute value of x. <laughs> And then we know just one more. What's the other one we know? The exponential one. Antiderivative of e to x dx is e to x plus a constant. And it's sort of a nice thing about this course is that these are the only three. <laughs> just these three. Notably, you know how to anti-differentiate that thing, that kind of thing, that kind of thing, and that kind of thing. And what I'd like for you to observe is that in those red boxes, are there any absolute values? Not, I'm not talking about over here. I'm talking about in the red boxes. There aren't any, right? There aren't any absolute values. And here I'm asking you to integrate something that has absolute values in it. And if you want to use the fundamental theorem, that means that you want to anti-differentiate some things that have absolute values. Mm -hmm. And there are no antiderivatives that you know that involve absolute values. So you can't use the fundamental theorem. OK, so then does that mean we're just out of luck? Not, no, it means that we have to get, we have to use our wits to figure out what's happening. How can we, how can we prevail against this exercise in spite of the fact that we can't use the fundamental theorem? I don't understand what you mean, plug in values. So you put in 2 times 7 minus 6 minus 2 times 1 minus 6? You definitely can't do that. So the, you, you could only do that kind of thing if you knew the antiderivative. But we don't have one. Yes? I'm not sure what you mean, a u substitution? Yeah. You could. You could make a u substitution. But that, in the end, would not help anything. Because even after the substitution, you'd still have absolute value. Right? It's the absolute value that's killing us. Somehow we've got to be rid of it. We've got to dispense with it and be done. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to, to proceed. OK. Well, let's recall. Now, that's absolute value of 2x minus 6. Let's simplify our life a little bit and just consider absolute value of x. 
for a moment. What does the shape of y equal to absolute value of x look like? A v, right? Absolute value of x by itself looks like this. So it's reasonable to conclude that this other thing, y is 2x minus 6, is also going to look like some kind of v. But it's going to be moved around a bit. Okay. So that's how it looks like visually. So algebraically, please recall that the absolute value of x algebraically is defined as x in the case that x is greater or equal to 0, and it's something else when x is less than 0. So what goes right here? negative x. So that's the definition of absolute value. So what that's saying is that no, notice that the shape of absolute value is a v and what I'd like for you to imagine is that it's like two lines that have been glued together. This line is the line y equal x. That's what that one is. What is this, what is this one right here? y is negative x. So what absolute value is, it's like gluing together these two lines at the origin. So absolute value has the neat property as a machine that whatever you put in on the input side, the output is either going to be exactly the same or the negation of whatever you put in. So for example, the absolute value of 6 is 6 same thing we put in. The absolute value of negative 8 is negative negative 8, which is 8. Right? So whatever comes out of the absolute value is always what you put in or the negation of what you put in. So we're interested in a slightly more complicated absolute value. So therefore, the absolute value of 2x minus 6 is right. It's 2x. It's either going to be 2x minus 6, the same thing that you put in, or it's going to be a negative 2x minus 6, which is to say negate what it is that you put in. So now, under what circumstance, under what circumstance will it be this one, 2x minus 6? That's close, but not right. So you, you said this. It's not, not quite right, but it's close. OK, I agree with 3. I, and I agree with that too, but how did you get there? Okay, so I'm gonna, I agree with that, uh, but I'm going to back it up just slightly and say it like this. I'm covering up something with my pinky there. So now it says absolute value of pinky. So if what is I'm covering up is positive, non-negative really. By the way, what's the difference between a positive, something that's positive and something that's non-negative? Not, not quite. Sort of mathematicians splitting hairs here. So positive means greater than zero. That's what that means. Non-negative means greater or equal to zero. So it's whether or not you're including zero. So I just want to make sure that's clear because sometimes I get a little excited and just rattle on and I might, it might be kind of confusing. Why did he say 
non-negative. <laughs> that means it's greater or equal to zero. So this is going to be 2x minus 6 when, when 2x minus 6 is greater or equal to zero. Okay? And it's going to be negative 2x minus 6 when 2x minus 6 is less than 0, which is just an exact restatement of what I said about the absolute value as a machine. What does it do? If you put something in, if you give something as input, the output is either that same thing or the negation of that thing, depending on whether or not it was positive. So if you put a, if you put a giraffe into the absolute value machine, then the output is either going to be a giraffe or the negation of a giraffe. That's it. So the output is either this or that. So now, we could do better than this. We could make this inequality simpler. So this particular one, what could we, how could we make this inequality simpler? So in particular, I want to solve for x. So how could we solve for x? Right. Well, I think we're saying the same thing. So I could move the 6 over. So I'll do that. So this would be 2x minus 6. And then that will be when 2x is greater or equal to 6. And then I could distribute that negative n to get negative 2x plus 6, and then I could move that 6 over and say 2x less than 6. But we can do even better than this, too. How can we do better than this? Divide by 2. So this would be 2x minus 6 when x is greater or equal to 3, and it is negative 2x plus 6 when x is less than 3. Okay. So, what I want you to observe about this algebra that we've been talking about is that what, what is the picture of this? How does it appear? <clears throat> so this particular, this, the original absolute value, this one, it, it changes its mind about how it's going to behave at x is 0. That's where it changes its mind. It's saying, I'm going to be like this if I'm to the right of 0. And I'm going to be like that if I'm to the left of zero. That's where it changes its mind. That's where the pointy place is. Where does this one change its mind? At three. So at three, at three is where this absolute value changes its mind. To the right of three, to the right of three, it's a line that slopes up with slope two. So it looks like this. To the left of 3, what is it? A line that slopes down. So it looks something like this. So now, is there any question about why the particular absolute value looks like this? Yeah? No, it's a V. It, it doesn't do any more bendies besides this, besides this right here. Other questions? Okay, so then now we were integrating from where to where? 1 to 7, right? So if this is 1, and 
And if this is 7, it's not necessarily to scale here. Then what is being requested is we're asking for a particular area. The area under the curve from 1 to 7. Can you see it? What's being asked for? We're being asked for this part, that green part, and we're also being asked for this graphite part. So does everyone see the two pieces? So now, suppose that you had a fence that looked like this. And suppose that it was just in your heart that you just had to make this part green and you had to make that part graphite. It was just, oh, I've just, that'd be the perfect, <laughs> that'd be the perfect fence. Okay, well then you could do them separately, right? You get the green paint, you do that part. You get the graphite colored paint, you do that part. Well, what I'm telling you is that I've asked you to integrate this. And the way that you can achieve this is by doing them separately. You can do them separately. What I'm telling you is that what, what I want from you is please tell me what would be the limits of integration to do the green part? One to three. So we can integrate from one to three absolute value of 2x minus 6 dx. That would, be the, that would give us the green part. And then we need to add to that the integral that would give us the graphite part. What integral would give us the graphite part? So this would be the integral from 3 to 7 of absolute value of 2x minus 6 dx. OK. Now, I'd like to make an objection to what I've done. <laughs> we're we're going to get there. So I'd like to point out that I, it, it, at least at first glance, before, before you can make a further deduction, before we, before we do make a further deduction, it seems like I've made the problem worse. Right, we started out with an integral and I remarked that we can't use the fundamental theorem because what I'm asking you to do has an absolute value in it. And so now what I've said is, well, now we have two of them <laughs> that have absolute values. And in that sense, it sort of seems like the problem is even worse than where we started. Now we've got twice as many problems. <laughs> but here's the deal. This is what we're integrating, this thing. And suppose, so that means that we're not sure if we should be using that clause or that clause. There's two clauses. Now suppose that I make the promise to you, the contractual promise. I promise to you that yes, this is the function that we're going to use, but I promise you that I will never give you an x that is less than 3. Suppose that I make that promise to you. Which clause would we be using then? If I, if I always give you ones that are greater or equal to 3, we'll always be using the first clause. Right? So if I call this uh, the graphite clause, then we would always be using the graphite clause to color the graphite piece. That's the piece that's to the right of 3. Similarly, what if I said, I promise you, under no circumstance will I give you an x greater than or equal to 3. All of the x's that I will give you are going to be less than 3. So if all of them are less than 3, which clause will, will we be using all of the time? That one, right? All that I want you to observe is that this green clause is the one that corresponds to the green piece. And that graphite clause is the one that corresponds to the graphite piece. Absolute 
as a result, that means that for this integral when we're doing 1 to 3, we don't need to integrate. It doesn't need to be absolute value of 2x minus 6. We can actually, actually drop that absolute value and replace it with what? We can actually replace it with negative 2x plus 6. dx. So does everyone see that I cha we change this absolute value stuff to that? Now, what's the corresponding trick for the other one? So this will now be integral still 3 to 7, but then what will, be in what will we be integrating? 2x minus 6 without absolute value. Now I claim this is, this is a terrific development. Why is this terrific now? It's pretty. <laughs> yeah, the absolute values are gone. All of that, I would like to point out that no calculus has occurred as of yet. This has been entirely an algebraic and geometric argument that is allowing us to dispense with the absolute value. We can now use the fundamental theorem twice, once and again. So does everyone see that, okay, we traded the original integral for which we could not use the, the fundamental theorem for two integrals and we can use the fundamental theorem twice to answer the question. However, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to do something even, even slicker, even nicer. And it has to do with this question is actually relatively simple. So look at this shape. I claim that we can integrate this in a very easy way. What do you mean count? There's something we could do quite easily. So, for example, what I want you to see is that we're saying that the whole shape is actually two shapes, the green part and the graphite part. What is the name of the shape of the green part? It's a triangle. And do you observe the graphite part is also a triangle? And how, are, how is integral related to, what is the geometric interpretation of integral? Yeah, you're cutting things into rectangles. But, but if I asked you what is the integral of that green triangle, then what, what is the integral of that green tri triangle? What's the geometry of it? It's its, it's its area, right? Integral and area. Those two concepts. Just like the geometric interpretation of derivative is slope, the slope of the tangent line, right? Every calculus student that, that passes calculus needs to be able to say the geometric interpretation of the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And they also need to be able to say the geometric interpretation of integral is the area under the curve. The, the integral that's corresponding to this piece will be its area. Well, that's a triangle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the inter I'm gonna finish the question by just measuring the triangles and just doing one half base height which I encourage you to do. Take every, sh take every available shortcut. So specifically, um, how can I figure out how tall this is? What do we do? We plug in one, right? We plug in one into absolute value of two x minus six and that'll be, we'll be using this one. So if we plug one into here, what's the answer? Four. So that means that this has height four. How do we figure out this height?
Well, we're supposed to plug something in. What are we supposed to plug in? Seven. So if you plug seven in, which clause are we going to use? The top one, right? So two times seven is 14, and then minus six is eight. So this is eight. So does everyone see? Ah, <laughs> we now have the bases in height. What's the base of this triangle? What is it? Two, right? Three minus one is two. And what's the base of this one? Four, right? So the answer to the question then is one half base height. So one half times two times four plus one half times four times eight. So what would that be? That'd be four and then plus 16. That's 20. Which is to say, if, if you wanted to paint your fence just so, what this is saying is you need four gallons of green paint and 16 pound gallons of graphite paint, and altogether you need 20 gallons of paint. Any question about this exercise? Any question about it? OK. So now let's do another one that sort of exemplifies all of the ideas we just went over. So suppose that we have this function, h of x is this piecewise defined function. Let's say that it's 4x plus 1 when x is less or equal to 2, and that it is x squared when x is greater than 2. So this is a piecewise defined function. That's, that's what the kind of thing it's called. So, so what this is saying is that to the left of 2, it behaves like that, 4x plus 1. And to the right of 2, it behaves like that, like x squared. So it sort of changes its mind. Anytime that I'm, <laughs> anytime it's before 2 o'clock, <laughs> I'm like this. And then it, after 2 o'clock, I'm like that. OK. Suppose that I ask you then to do the following. Suppose I say, please evaluate the integral uh, from 1 to 5 of h of x dx. Now let's look at this function. So how many antiderivatives do you know? Three. And do any of those antiderivatives involve piecewise defined functions? Yet, right? <laughs> so that means that we can't, we can't use the fundamental theorem, at least not directly. OK, so then can someone give us an idea of what we might do? Mm-hmm. Very good. So we'll say, well, 2 is where it changes its mind. So I'm just going to integrate up to 2. I'm going to take care of that. We'll do that. And then I'm going to integrate from 2 to 5 and take care of that. And we're going to do these things separately. OK, well, as for this first integral, because we're integrating from 1 to 2, what that's saying, because we're integrating from 1 to 2, that's saying that I promise you that all the x's we're going to consider when we're doing this, just this part, all the x's we're going to consider are going to be between 1 and 2. And we're not going to consider big x's. Not, not things like 20. Those are too far. Only things between 1 and 2. And because we're only integrating things between 1 and 2, 
which expression can we use? The top one, right? 4x plus 1. So this is the integral from 1 to 2 of 4x plus 1 dx. And then plus. So now we're integrating from 2 to 5. And that is saying that I promise you that all of the x's that we're going to consider are between 2 and 5. So which expression are we supposed to use? x squared. So is there any question how we did that? So from here, this is two antiderivatives that you already knew how to do. So let's do them quickly, because this is the boring part. So do you know the antiderivative of 4x plus 1? 2x squared plus x. And then evaluate this from 1 to 2. And then what's the antiderivative of x squared? Mm-hmm. Very good. Okay. And then <clears throat> this would be what? 8 plus 2 is 10. And then minus 3 plus 125 over 3 minus 8 over 3. So that would be 7 plus 125 minus 8 is 117 over 3, which is 39, plus 7 is 46. OK. So any question about this exercise? So now, purposefully on this exercise, I tried to draw no pictures whatsoever because I want to show you that it, can, that it can be done without pictures. But I want to make it clear that there's a perfectly reasonable way to interpret this as a picture. And that is, if you were to plot this function, where does it change its mind about how it's going to behave? At 2, right? So at 2 is where, it, is where it changes its mind. How is it behaving to the left of 2? Like that line, right? 4x plus 1. So to the left of 2, to the left of 2, it kind of looks like this. It's a line. What kind of thing is it to the right of 2? It's a parabola, right? So this red bit is the line. And this green bit is a parabola. So it sort of looks like, like that, going that way. And then we said, well, what we're interested in is we're interested in integrating from 1 to 5. Well, here's 1. And over here is 5. So on this picture, can you tell me what we were asking about? What were we asking about? from 1 to 5, right? And, and we said that, well, it's sort of like taking this red piece, and we'll just do it by itself, right? We'll just take care of that. Then, after we've done that, we'll take care of the green piece. And what I want you to see is that this is the green piece. 
has size 39, not to scale. And the red piece is this. It has size 7. And altogether, the amount of area of red and green together is 46. Okay, so any questions about this? So you could imagine that I could do something crazy, right? I could give you a, I could give you a piecewise defined function with 12 clauses, right? Which instead of having two colors, red and green, we could just go through the whole rainbow, right? Just straight down. I would never do that. It'd be too many. But something like this for sure. Okay, so any question about this exercise? Okay. So now let's back away from the concept a little bit. And what I mean is like the, the, the pictures and things like that. And let's move to uh, just computation for a moment. So suppose I ask, please compute the integral from 0 to 5 of x multiplied by the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. Well, it's an integral. And it would be terrific if we could use the fundamental theorem. Because that would mean that we wouldn't have to draw a shape and cut it into pieces and all of that. So is this, ex is this exactly one of the antiderivatives that we know? Exactly one of the three special ones? It's not, right? Well, so what should we do? You mean change the radical to half? We, we could do that, and we are going to do that, but I'm going to hold that off for just a minute. We will need to do that. What do we need to do? There's something a little more pressing in order to make progress. You could, it, it is possible to factor the thing in the radical. You could factor it as 5 plus x multiplied by 5 minus x. That's possible and correct, but it wouldn't be helpful. A u substitution. This is what we need to do, okay? Because there's nothing, in the end, the problem that we're facing, we want to we wanna use the fundamental theorem, which means we want to do an antiderivative. We want to find an antiderivative. And the problem that we're facing is we've got a bunch of stuff under a radical. And any time that there's a bunch of stuff under a radical, that's a problem. A problem that's got to be overcome. So, so, what would be your suggestion as to what we should name to be you? Yeah. Generally speaking, if, you've got a, if you're performing an antiderivative and you've got a radical and it's got a bunch of stuff in it, it's, it's mm -hmm. often the right thing to do is to say, well, I'm going to try doing a substitution with you as everything that's in the radical. It's, it's not always correct. But it's often correct. So 25 minus x squared. Then, would someone please remind us, what's the full name of the substitution method? It's got a, it's got a longer name. Yeah. That's part of it. But what's the, the name, the long name of it? Something like that. It's called a variable differential substitution. Variable differential substitution. Remember, right, not just math, but everywhere, 
The beginning of wisdom is calling things by their proper name. Okay, so this is properly called a variable differential substitution, which is to say, these are the variables we're going to substitute. But it's not permissible to just substitute variables. You must also substitute differentials. Which, so how do we figure out what's, what the differential substitution is? Mm -hmm. So we can compute du dx. That gives us negative 2x squared, uh, negative 2x dx, I mean to say. So then we could say, uh, well, du is negative 2x dx. Or you could just do it all in one step if, when you get comfortable doing that. <clears throat> okay, well, that's almost what we need, but it's a little bit too much. Which is to say, you can see that we've got the x, we've got the dx, but the negative 2 is too much. So how do we fix it? Right. Co correct. So du over negative 2 is x dx. Okay, now, what we're saying is that the stuff in the red is going to re be replaced by this u. So those are the variables that are being replaced. And the stuff in the green, x dx, is being replaced with du by 2. So now, have we substituted everything then? Is there anything that we've missed? There is. Something that we've missed. The limits, right? Because remember, what the what the what integrating is, right? I've been trying to make the analogy to painting. This is saying that I want you to integrate from x values zero to x value five. And if we're going to change the variable from x's to u's, that means that we're going to change how far to the left we are in u and how far to the right we are in u. It would be just like <laughs> it would be just like if the United States made a really expensive satellite to go to Mars and crashed it into the surface at thousands of miles an hour. Because <laughs> because one part of the subsystem was made in metric like it should have been and the other part was made in pounds and inches, like it shouldn't have been. <laughs> and they didn't perform the correct conversion factor, right? You gotta remember that when you change units, when you change units, you've also gotta change limits, right? So like, what, what is it? One inch is 2.54 centimeters. Okay, which is to say that what we need to know is that when x is 0, what is u? It's 25. And how did you figure that out? Right, correct. So specifically, you, you put x is 0 in here. OK? And <clears throat> When x is 5, what is u? 0. So now, what I'm saying is that now this, this red information covers that red, this green information covers that green, and this blue information covers all this blue. Now after this, this is, the this is the variable differential substitution. So what are the new limits? 
25 to 0. I'm going to say something about that in a minute. Uh, then the new thing being anti-differentiated, being integrated, is uh, what? Square root u and then du over 2, uh, negative 2. Now, at this point, a lot of students say, no, 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 you made an error. It should be 0 to 25 because the big number always goes on top. So, have I made an error? No, I haven't made an error. Now, it is, in it is usually the case that the big number goes on top. That is usually the case. I don't disagree. But it is not the case now. Why is it not the case now? So what I'm, what I'm talking about is the fact that I'm saying 25 to 0 which is weird. Why is that the correct thing to say? Well, the question in the end is, in the original integral, which one was, what was the bottom limit? It was zero, right? <clears throat> and what did zero become? Zero became 25. That's why the 25 is on the bottom. And in the original integral, what was on the top? 5. And what did 5 become? 0. That's why they are where they are. Okay, so any question about that? So you just need to pay close attention to that because it's not always the case that the top and bottom limits are in ascending order. Okay, so now I'm going to factor out the division by negative 2 as negative half and then integral 25 to 0, square root u, du. And then I'm going to say, you know what, I, really, I just really would like it if, I know they're not in ascending order, I know, I know that it's supposed to be 25 to 0, but I would just really like it to be 0 to 25. How could I arrange for that? Right. So suppose that I just really, really wanted it to be, 0 to 25 square root u du what's the cost of flipping the order of limits? to negate it right? so I, I'll make that minus a plus okay? so that's everybody with me to here so from this place it's, it's totally boring so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it very quick so this is now half and then square root of u, well, that could be expressed as u to half. So that would be u to 3 halves, and then divide by 3 halves, and then this now evaluated from 0 to 25. Now, in an analogous position, when we were doing an antiderivative, I would say something like, is this the answer? And then, we would, and then I would, <coughs> that's me prompting you to say, no, <clears throat> no, it's not the answer because it has got to be back in dx's, right? So my question to you here and now is that do we need to go back to x's? Okay, so we don't, we don't need to go back to x's. There's a lot of reasons. What y'all were saying is a, is a reason, but in a sense the overarching reason is that what kind of answer is the answer to this prompt? What kind of thing is it? Will it be a squirrel? What will it be? A number, right? The answer is going to be something like 8. And notably, there's no x's in it. Now, if we were doing an antiderivative, what kind of thing would the answer be? It'd be a function, right? A function of x. That's why when you're doing antiderivatives, you've always got to get back to whatever you started with. But for the integral, the answer is a number. There's no x's or, 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 anything, or anything else. So, no, we don't need to get back to the x's. So division by 3 halves is the same as multiplication by 2 thirds. So this would be a third 
and then u to three, because the two's cancel, u to three halves, zero to 25. So this would be a third, and then 25 to three halves minus, well, zero, right? Because if you plug in zero, you get zero. So, but that raises the question, how do you evaluate 25 to 3 halves, like if you found yourself without a calculator? Mm -hmm. you, could, you could do the cube first, but it would be better to do something else. So what I mean is that the answer is 25 to 1 half to 3. So what's the square root of 25? 5. And then what's 5 cubed? 125. So the answer is 125 over 3. Any question about this? This is OK. Okay. One more of these and then we'll move to the next kind of thing. <coughs> so how about <coughs> the integral from 4 to 6 of 2 divided by Two x minus seven squared dx. Are you sub again? I think so. Okay, so Like in the previous exercise, when on the previous exercise you've got a radical and it's got all kinds of stuff in it, generally it's a good idea to say u is all that stuff. Right? In the end we said u is 25 minus x squared on the previous exercise. So what might be a good idea for this one? Yeah, I think 2x minus 7 would be good. The stuff that's inside of that, inside of those parentheses that's being squared. I think that would be a good idea. So I'm going to do a substitution, but just to make sure that um, you don't get too emotionally attached to u's, I'm going to use some other letter. Uh, so how, but, and th the only letter that's really off limits is, a, is d. Because if you, <laughs> if you try and use letter d, then you have dd, d and just this, it just doesn't work vi visually. So let's use, uh, how about, how about A? So we'll do A is 2x minus 7. And this is a variable differential substitution. So besides this variable, what else do we need? Yeah, we need DA. So what's DA then? 2dx. Because if you differentiate the right hand side, it would be, well, if you did da dx, it would be 2. And if you multiply it out, it's da is 2dx. Okay. So have we, have we done it all then? Not quite. There's one other thing. Well, we've got 2dx. I mean, yeah, I mean the limits. So what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll do it at the bottom one. So what is A when x is 4? 1. And then what is A when x is 6? Is it 5? Yeah, 5. OK, so that means that all this stuff in red here 
is being replaced by A. <coughs> and all this stuff in green is being replaced by DA. And all this stuff in blue is being replaced by this stuff in blue. So is there any question on how we come up, came up with, with these things? So making that substitution, this is now the integral, and what are the limits? One to five. And is that the right order? Yes, that's the right order. Okay, so then now this will be, watch, one over a squared dA. So any question about getting to this position? So now, which one is this? Is this logarithm of a squared? Right. It only it, it would be the it would be the logarithm antiderivative if it was one over a, just a. But this is one over a squared, so it's not the logarithm one. Rather We need to interpret it as, uh, as some of you, many of you said, uh, a to negative two. Okay. So then, what is what is the antiderivative of a to negative two? A to negative one. Divide by negative one, and then evaluate from one to five. Okay. So now I'm going to do some little tricks that make uh, life a little easier. So in the first place, uh, division by negative one is the same as multiplication by negative one. And then now, I'm gonna spend that negative. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what I mean by that? I'd like I'd like to not have the negative there. Oh yeah, you could switch the limits. Right. I could switch the limits and then dispense with that negative. So I could write it as a to negative one, and then now I'm going to evaluate from five to one. So that lets me be rid of that that negative. And then for the purpose of calculus, uh, a to negative one is a good representation, but the calculus part is over. Now we're doing algebra. So a better representation usually is 1 over a. So 1 over a from 5 to 1. And now there's no stalling any further. Uh, we simply must do it now. So this would be what? 1 minus a fifth, which is 4 fifths. Okay, any question about this exercise? Yes? <clears throat> you get the same answer. No. However, if you don't if you don't do the little niceties that I just did, then you end up getting things like it, it, the 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 question would have been the answer would have looked something like um, it just would have looked a little more complicated. You, there, there would have been potentially multiple negations. It would have been it would have been 
particularly bad, possibly, if the limits were negative. Because then you'd have multiple negations of negations. Yeah, well, whatever, any, any legitimate method is correct, is, is fine. But, if you, but it's nice to know little things that you can do to make your life slightly easier. So I spent this negative by switching the order. It was 1 to 5 here, and then I changed it 5 to 1, so I got rid of that negative right there. Etc. Okay, <clears throat> good. So we've got the fundamental theorem. It allows us to um, <clears throat> really short circuit the integration process if we're able to, if we're able to find an antiderivative. Okay, and, and often in this class anyway, that means that you can I can give you an integral for a function that is, for example, piecewise defined and therefore it doesn't have an antiderivative, but you could break it up into its individual pieces and each one of those could have an antiderivative. Okay, so now we're in section 7.5, which is a fun section. <coughs> this is the area between curves. So now, to make sure that the, that the um, idea is clear, I'd like for you to consider my little piece of abstract art I'm going to draw. same width. Okay. So that's my little abstract art thing. And different people have different tastes. And you might say, you know what, I like that, but um, I'm gonna, if, since, since it's going to be mine, I'm going to make a little modification. I'm going to take this last piece right here, and I'm going to move it down just a little bit. I think it would look better if it was moved down. So suppose you make that modification to it. My question to you is, is how much did you change the area? You didn't, right? Because remember that area does not change under a rigid rotation. So in principle, right, if this was actually a, a mechanical device, you could, you could put this artwork into a lot of different configurations by moving these pieces up and down. And that would not change the area of it. Okay, so then now, suppose you're very fastidious and you think, well, I, I need this to sit on a bookshelf. I would really like it to sit on a bookshelf, so I want it to, I want it to actually sit flat. And I want you to, to look. How, how would it look like if you set it flat? Well, it would look like this. There's two tall pieces, and they're, they're about the same length. And then there's a short piece that are kind of the same size, two of them. And then there's an even shorter piece. It might be slightly different in the way you drew it. But what I want you to observe is that the area of this configuration is the same as the area of, as of the other one. Okay, same areas. Now, if we were to take, if we were to take a little string here and modify it and make it an even more beautiful piece of art, you know, put a little string on the top there to where it looks like that, nice little string. 
on the top, and then we can put a little string on the bottom. <coughs> Now it's, you know, more beautiful, I suppose. Well, what I want you to observe is the following, is that in principle, this is no different than saying, okay, let's say that this is A and this is B, and we take some function here, and this is y is g of x. And then above it, we make some other function, say y is f of x. And suppose that I say, now I'm interested in the area of this shape. Well, the way we could get at it, the way we could get at it is we could say, okay, let's cut. Let's cut this shape into <coughs> infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles. So for example, here, here is a rectangle. That's a particular rectangle. And let's say that its width, the width of the base, is dx. It's a very skinny rectangle. Well, how tall is it? How tall is that rectangle? Almost, the other way around. Right, it's the top one minus the bottom one. And that's how tall it is. The green one, the green height minus the red height. So if this was at height 10 and this is at height 2, then it's, at, it's 8 tall. So that means that if we call this area, so that, that width there is, is uh, dx, this height is f of x minus g of x. That means that the area of that one differential rectangle is dA is f of x minus g of x, not squared, just dx. because that's base times height. Base times height is the area of just the one. So now how, what we want is the area of the whole shebang, the whole thing. How do we get, which is A, the whole thing, how do we get A from DA? You integrate, yeah, anti-differentiate. What are the limits of integration? Little a to b. Of f of x minus g of x dx. So what I want you to observe, and what I want you to understand, is that what we're saying is that to find the area, to find the area between these two curves, what we're doing is we're cutting this area into rectangles, and the rectangles are all slid up and down like this. They're all over the place like these are. But because here's finitely many of them, we could stack them flat on a bookcase and not change the area. That's what this integral is saying. It's saying, yeah, go ahead and take this. Go ahead and take this shape with its rectangles all not, not stacked flat properly on a bookshelf. 
go ahead and do it. And then you can put them all on a bookshelf. And then they have height f of x minus g of x. And then that doesn't change the area. And you can compute the integral in that way. So the fact that the area doesn't change when you move these little pieces up and down, even if there's infinitely many pieces, is a fact that's, it, it, in the first place, it is a fact. <laughs> And in the second place, it's important enough of a fact to have its own name. Its name is Cavalieri's principle. Cavalieri's principle. That's, that's not something that I'll test you over. It's just something that is neat to know, right? So if you go to a party this weekend, you could say, you know what? <laughs> Ca Ca Cavalieri's principle or whatever, okay. So, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's answer one of these. Let's do a question like this. Is there any question about uh, how we came to the answer? So, to, to put it a different way, a slightly different way, before we got to this section and before we said these things, what we said was, is that we can find the area of shapes where the shape is it has got a, a it's got a vertical segment on the left it's got a vertical segment on the right it's got a horn, horizontal segment on the bottom and then it's going to some party and it puts on a nice hat and it looks like that we could find areas of shapes that look like that okay and what i'm telling you is that this idea is enough and sufficient because of Cavalieri's principle to say that actually we can find the shapes, we can find the areas of shapes uh, where you can put on, you can put on uh, some fancy pants like this and a fancy hat. You can do both. So now you can be doubly fancy and still find the, the area. Okay. <clears throat> start out. Find the uh, shaded area. Okay, so now I've got to draw what I'm talking about. So that is the right-hand side, anyway, of parabola. And then now this. Okay, and the area that is requested is that. Okay, now before we, before we go about doing the calculus to answer this question, does everybody understand the question in principle? Like there's a little um, football shape region there and I want you to find its area. How much paint would it take to paint it? Okay, so. <clears throat> Conceptually, it goes like this. So here's an exaggerated version of that drawing. Something like 
like that. What we're going to do is we're going to, conceptually anyway, we're going to, for, for all these values of x, we're going to measure a rectangle. So we've got to figure out um, all of the areas. Now, what I want you to observe is that uh, I want you to imagine I could grab hold of this X and wiggle it around, and you'd see that rectangle wiggling around with it. And as I move it over here, it would get skinny, and then it would be biggest right here, or not skinny, but I guess short is better. It would, over here it would be short, and then here it's tallest, and then here it's short. Okay. Now, we don't need to measure anything over here. Why not? Right? I've got I've to move this rectangle around all in here, but I don't need the rectangle to be over here. Why not? Yeah, there's no shape over there. So there's no area to consider over there. Furthermore, and, or additionally, over here, there's also no shape. So what I want you to see is that there is a furthest extent left to the left that we need to go. And there is a furthest extent to the right that we need to go. And it's not necessary to go any further to the left than this, or any f further to the right than that. That's where we need to go, in here. Now my question to you is, is well, w just how far to the left is that, and just how far to the right is that? So this, because of the picture, I think we can probably all agree that that's zero, right? Because that's the furthest, because that's at the origin right there. But until you get comfortable with algebra, so that's zero. Until you get comfortable with algebra, it's not, it's not clear what that is, which is to say what that is. So does anyone know? Can any, can, is anyone comfortable enough to just say it? That's not true. No takers? Other takers? Okay, so let's figure it out algebraically. So, so does everybody see? We've got this. You can see it from the picture. But we've got to get that. That other one. So to find that and that, to find those two, you got it? It's one. Let's see why. To find that, we need to solve an equation. Specifically, specifically, if you look at this drawing, what we want to know is when the red is touching the green. But then the math name for touching, in this case, it's intersecting. We want to know, where are red and green intersecting? So the way that you do that is you solve the red thing equal to the green thing. So specifically, we're going to solve x squared equal square root x. Anytime you have a drawing and you want to know where things are touching, that comes down to solving an equation. OK. So I'm going to move the, the square root to the other side. So this would be x squared minus square root x equal to 0. And then I'm going to change that square root to fractional exponent half. And then now I'm going to factor out the common power of x. So what's the biggest power of x I can factor out? x to half. So this would be x to half, and then I want to factor, factor out all that stuff, which is to say, supposing we, fact, we do factor out x to half, then what needs to go in those parentheses? So it, the minus part is easy. It's minus how much? Minus 1. 
This part is a little more complicated until you're comfortable with it. What goes there? Three halves. It's three halves because when you factor out powers of x, you're subtracting. Two is four halves. And if you take away one half, well, there's three of them left. So that saying that saying that there's two solutions, one of them is that x to half is zero, the other one is that x to three halves is one. Those are the two possibilities. So now we want to get the x's by themselves which is to say we want, we want this exponent to change sides. So right here it's on the left hand side. How do I get the exponent to move to the right hand side? Which is to say it's half on the left. What is it on the right? Two. Yeah, it's squared. So, so it's, it's, it reciprocates switching sides. So or x is, so now I want this 3 halves to change sides. On the left hand side it's 3 halves. What is it on the right? 2 thirds. And then, well, 0 squared is easy enough. That's 0. And then what's 1 to 2 thirds? 1. Any question about the algebra? So the half change sides, the three halves change sides. So from the picture alone, you can determine that, oh, OK, well, the left fence post is 0. What's the right fence post then? 1. Notably, so far on the page, no calculus has occurred. <laughs> no calculus has occurred. No derivatives, no antiderivatives, no integrals, nothing. However, we were asked to compute that shaded area. And now we're in a position to say that the formula for this area is some calculus expression. What calculus expression? So in the first place, it'll be an integral, right? Because we want an area. 0 to 1, I agree. So, so yes, we're going to integrate a difference. Okay. So now, which one is it going to be? Is it going to be x squared minus square root x, or is it going to be square root x minus x squared? So the, so the way you make your decision is you look at the picture. In the end, it's got to be the top one minus the bottom one. The one that's on top minus the one that's on bottom. Which, which one's on top? Square root of x minus x squared. And at this point, on questions like this, lots of students come to my office in a slight state of confusion and they say, I don't know, it looks to me like x squared is bigger than the square root of x. Because isn't 2 bigger than half? How, how do I respond to such a thing? So what, so, so why is this the right one? Why is this the right way? Yeah, for this shape, in this region, it's just a fact that the green one is taller than the red one. It's just as simple as that. So now, in this class, all the, all the exercises are graded out of 10. Okay, uh, That's just to make things 
conceptually easy on the greater and on me. Getting to this point on this exercise is worth on the order of seven, six or seven of the points, probably about seven. Okay, just, just setting it up properly, making a sketch, getting the limits right, setting it up properly. That's worth the majority of all the points. The rest of the points is actually evaluating it properly. Okay, from here, using the fundamental theorem. Okay, so does everyone understand the balance, where the balance of credit is on, on these kinds of exercises? Okay, so from here it's just boring because we did stuff like this in the previous section. So this would be what? X to 3 halves, divide by 3 halves, and then minus x to 3 over 3, and then we're going to evaluate all of this from 0 to 1. It's very nice when the evaluation points are 0 and 1, because that makes evaluation easy. So that'd be what? 1 over 3 halves minus 1 over 3, and then minus 0, because when you plug in 0 and all that stuff, you get zeros. Well, division by 3 halves, what, what is 1 divided by 3 halves? two-thirds. So that's a weird way to, to write two-thirds. Two-thirds minus one-third is one-third. So to make a paint analogy, that would be saying that if it was your task <coughs> to paint this, it would take a third of a gallon of paint. Any question about this exercise? Yes? Would you do that like if you didn't have the picture? Like, is there a way you could like, discern that? Or, like... Let's do one without a picture. Okay, good. <laughs> <clears throat> So suppose I say, find the area bounded between and so I need to write a little thing here. Find the bounded area. The book doesn't usually write this because I agree that it sounds kind of weird, but you'll see what I mean in a moment. Find the bounded area, bounded between, there's too many boundeds, bounded, and so it sounds clumsy. Find the bounded area, bounded between, <coughs> uh, y is x squared uh, minus 30, Yeah, minus 30. And y is 10 minus 3x. OK, so no picture. So now you're going to have to reason your way through this. <clears throat> well, let's try and imagine. So these are two graphs. Let's consider this one just for a moment. What does the plot of this one look like? A parabola. And then, how does it open? Down or up? It opens up. How can you tell that it opens up? Yeah, it has a positive leading coefficient. So this one, in the end, must look like this, somehow. A smiley face. What does the plot of this one look like? A line. How does it slope? Down, because it has a negative leading coefficient. 
So we've got two, uh, two plots, and they look like that. Now, there's one more piece of information, and that is that I promise that I'll always give you a question that makes sense. Okay, or, or it can be made sen that, that you can make sense of what is being asked. So what I want you to imagine is look at, look at the, that red shape and the green shape. And I want you to imagine how could they possibly be intersecting each other so that the question would make sense? So that there would be an area that's bounded between them. How, how must it look? Oh, I like that. <laughs> she said, she said that, that the, green, the green line has to be a secant of the parabola. I like that. Yeah, I agree. It's got to cut it twice. Okay, so it's got to look like this. Okay, so then it cuts it twice, once there and once there. So now, just like, now it's getting quite similar to the previous exercise. <clears throat> so by, by bounded area, right, there's this, this area right here is between the two plots, but so is this area. But the thing about this area over here is that the parabola goes up, the line goes down, and this area is unbounded. Right? It, go, it, goes, it goes all the way this way. There's infinite amount of area over here. And similarly, this area right here is between the two, but this area goes all the way over here, so it's unbounded. The only bounded part is, the, is that part. So that means that the area in consideration is this area. So does everybody understand that's the area? Then, <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to consider how far left are we supposed to go and how far right? Which is to say, in the picture, we need that and that. That's what we need. We need that uh, value and we need that value. So how do we find those values? Right, exactly the same way that we did before. These are, the name for these is, are, I, I, the name is intersections. Okay, so then every time you want to find intersections that comes down to algebraically solving an equation. So to find these, <coughs> We're going to solve the red one, x squared minus 30, equal to the green one, 10 minus 3x. So since we're running short on time, I'm going to do this part quick. So uh, x squared plus 3x, moving all the stuff to one side, and then minus 40. A quadratic, does the quadratic factor? Yeah, it factors to x plus 8 multiplied by x, mi uh, yeah, x minus 5. <clears throat> so the solutions are negative 8 and positive 5. And what, what do those solutions, what bearing do those solutions have on the picture? Exactly. This is negative 8 and this one is 5. So then, note, it, uh, note that so far on this exercise, zero calculus has occurred. No calculus has occurred. However, we can now write down a formula for the area that is being requested. What is the formula for the area that's being requested? Yeah.
Yes. Right, so, so it, it's always got to be the top one minus the bottom one. So in particular, it's got to be green minus red. And it, it will be as you say. So that'd be 10 minus 3x. And then that's the top one minus the bottom one, x squared minus 30 dx. Getting to this position, properly getting it to here, setting, setting it up, is worth about seven points. Okay, the rest of the points are, can you now carry it to the end? Okay, and we're out of time, so you're gonna have to carry it to the end by yourself. Yes? No. I mean, as long as, long as you can successfully draw a picture. Yes, that would be just fine, yeah.